Welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about navigating tool chains to do with DevOps. So we're going to discuss a few things like what the DevOps tools are, what categories they are in, which ones are right for you, and um, how they fit together. You know, do they communicate well? Are some work better than others together? Are they all friendly? That kind of thing. And then the maintenance and of course the evolution because nothing stands still. Let's get into it. So the categories of tools, there are lots of DevOps tools that you can use and they're going to fall into some vague categories. But before I talk about that, we have to talk about where, where the tool is going to live. As with everything in computing these days, you've got two options. It can either be local or data center or in the cloud. And so a lot of these tools, you get the choice of where that's going to be. Is it going to be software as a service? So somebody's on the cloud and they present you with a login interface. You create your user account and off you go with the tool. Great. Or is it going to be self-hosted? So this means it could be uh, on-prem, a little box next to you, perhaps. It could be uh, in your own data center if you've got such a thing or you can host it in the cloud. The point is, is that you're looking after the, the, the tool in its entirety. You're looking after the setting up the machine that's gonna host it, the installation, the patches, the updates, and all of the other admin that needs to go with that kind of thing. Or there's a hybrid. Perhaps some of the tool will exist on the cloud and some of it will be more local to you. Uh, the classic example of this is going to be when we're talking about CI, CD. You might have the main thing in the cloud, but you might have local agents that are either on your um, really local machine or another machine that you control. So let's talk about the first category, shall we? Version control. Again, we're going to, going to have this self-hosted uh, or hybrid kind of thing. So our version control comes in two parts. You're going to have a server element, which is where you can, you know, back up or save your source uh, in order for it to be shared with your team members or um, even just a backup from your own machine. Uh, and then you're going to have the local component, which is where it's working on your local computer where you're doing the development. And there's two main types of version control software out there. Uh, there's actually lots more, but I'm only going to focus on two of them because it's the only two that I see most often. Subversion, sometimes called SVN, uh, and that comes with uh, a, a client, um, which is uh, you know, Tortoise, I think is a relatively good one of those. Uh, and then there's a server version. So if you wanted to host subversion code, you can go to something like SourceForge. On the other side of the fence, there's also Git, and Git's quite new. Um, it was developed by Linus Torvalds, the same geezer that came up with uh, half of the Linux kernel. And it too has a two, um, a, a two server client setup thing. So you've got the local client that works on your machine, acts as the client. You also got the server side of that, where you can set it up on a server and have uh, SSH access into that server in order to copy your source code up to. But then when we're talking about Git, you've also got lots of other things that sit on top of it. So you might want uh, this, the feature rich experience that GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab give you. Uh, and all of those uh, come with a self-hosted version. So you can have GitHub Enterprise if you've got a few coins. If you haven't got coins, you can go with GitLab, which is a, a sort of open sourcey kind of version that you can install on your own um, hardware or virtual machines, because I don't suppose anyone's using hardware anymore. Uh, and then you still got the client version, which you have to install on your local machines, okay? So next category, CI, CD or continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, this actually means a whole bunch of things, not just those two things. Uh, but again, if you're using GitLab for your source control, or indeed GitHub for your source control, then they come with some CI CD options for you out of the box to use. So GitLab comes with a CI. Uh, it uh, uses YAML to configure runners and stuff. And this is where uh, you can have this hybrid kind of setup 
So you might have GitLab that you're buying as a software as a service, but then locally or in a data center or wherever you want to put it, actually, uh, you might have the separate runners that then act as agents to run your specific pipelines and code and all that kind of thing. And the same for GitHub. GitHub, um, I say, does come as an enterprise if you want to host a server. But if you're using GitHub as in the uh, software as a service, then you can also have your own uh, private agents that execute your actions in this case. Also in the CICD space, we have uh, a lot of other competitors. So I'm just going to pick out uh, another two. Most of these are going to be um, self-hosted, but couple of them, there are some spin-off support companies that will give you a fully supported option. I'm going to talk about Concourse, uh, which uh, is uh, largely written to exist within Docker sort of setups. Um, and it's not the only one. It is, I guess it's quite old now. It might have been superseded by a few more, if that's your thing. Uh, but it, it comes with the server and the clients and the um, the server and agents, I should say. And then the goldie oldie is Jenkins, which uh, is usually always a self-hosted solution, but there are um, companies out there that will give you a software as a service version of Jenkins as well. In either case, you need to look after your agents to make sure they've got what they're on, um, make sure the agents have got whatever they need to do the running things. And uh, most of these tools will enable you to use Docker agents as a thing so that you can spin them up and uh, destroy them really quickly. Next category, please. Monitoring. Oh, so monitoring. Everything needs to be monitored. Uh, how else will you know it goes wrong or is not broke? Put it another way. Um, so again, we've got quite a few options. If you want to go down the software as a service route, we've got services like Datadog and New Relic. If you want to go for um, the hosted, then we've got stuff like Nagios and we've got Prometheus and we've got Grafana. And uh, all of these have the same similar components. You're going to have a admin component where you can look after the users. You're going to have a database component where all of the bits of data flow into, and that needs to be managed from a size perspective because, boy, that stuff can grow really quickly if you want to keep a lot of it. You know, two weeks is usually what I see in production land, and that's usually enough for something to be spotted and diagnosed before that data disappears. Uh, and then you've got the uh, sort of reporting side of it, the visualization side of it. So stuff like dashboards and graphs and all the pretties like that, so that you can have at a glance what's going on. And of course, monitoring is also going to give you a third element, which is the alerting side of things. So, you know, you can have a baseline of something happening, you know, a metrics like la 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 la, and then some absurd happens like all oh, your traffic dies, which is bad, or you get a spike in traffic, which is also bad. Um, but you want to know about that straight away, so you want to get alerts. Uh, and so various alerting tools can also plug into these, uh, like Sensu or uh, other alerting systems, you know, page duty, things like that. And then for logging, Logging it all kind of almost sits outside of this because it's not just purely metrics, although you can create metrics off your logs. Uh, but logging then has the actual detail of um, you know whatever the the application is outputting. You know, so and so access this URL, and then we process that URL, and then oh, it was this user, and you know all those separate things that you might have for your logging in your application. Again, takes up a lot of space. Be careful how much you retain. And then we move on to the infrastructure as code tools. So we can have uh, stuff like um, Terraform, which will create your infrastructure. And um, more importantly, it can change, detect, drift, and destroy your infrastructure as well. And all of these are important for you to keep your handle on cost because infrastructure in the cloud, they're very good at uh, inviting you to create stuff and then start billing you for it. Um, and so you need to be responsible with um, you know, paring that down to what you need. Otherwise, you'll uh, get a call from your bank manager 
uh, saying we've got this rather large bill from AWS. You know, what do you want to do about that? Infrastructure's code can also be managed by the cloud providers. So AWS provide cloud formation. Uh, Azure is DevOps and Google and uh, various other players have their own things. Um, but you can use Terraform in order to control those as well. So Terraform can create cloud formation, which is like, I don't know, some kind of um, going in on itself thing, maybe. Anyway, I digress. Configuration management. So once we've got our infrastructure configured, we've got our firewalls, we've got our subnets, we've got our networks, we've got a couple of servers popping up. We then need to tell the servers what to do. The tool of choice there is going to be Ansible. Uh, unless, of course, you're used to more declarative stuff, in which case you can go down the Chef or Puppets um, route. And then there's Salt Stack, which I'm not going to lie, I've never seen that in the wild. Um, but if that's your thing, Salt Stack is available too. And so I've already touched on this before, containers. Um, container solutions exist in the cloud and they exist for local um, deployments um, and the hybrid, the stuff in between, right? So we've got stuff like Docker, if you want to deal with just the Docker containers, um, which is great because then you can have a machine um, just hosting Docker and then something else managing what runs on it, uh, like Docker Swarm. Or you can have Docker and then just use some scripts to start Docker containers. Bit clunkier, but um, might work for a small setup. Uh, or Docker Compose, if you want something a little bit more elevated in, I'd say, Docker Swarm. Um, and there's various other orchestrators that can work with that. Um, maybe you want to go Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a data center all in itself. It's got load balances. It's got ingress gateways. It's got Docker stuff. It's got monitoring. It's got everything in there you could possibly need. And maybe a price tag and a support burden and also that learning curve that goes with it. If you want to pare down slightly, we got stuff like AWS provides ECS, which is kind of like Docker Swarm, but a little bit more advanced, I suppose. I don't think Docker Swarm is being developed anymore because ECS exists. Um, Google Apps is another similar thing, but I think that's got Kubernetes somewhere under the hood too. Uh, and so we do have software as a service for containers. Uh, there are other services as well that will host Docker containers. Um, if you uh, know of one, put it in the comments below. Uh, if you want to ask questions about that, also put that in the comments below and I'll let you know what those are. And so we're nearing the list. End here. Artifacts. We're building code. We're compiling. You know, we're, we're playing lightsabers on our uh, wheelchairs whilst we're waiting for the code to compile with our CI CD pipeline. What's it going to do with it? Well, it needs to do two things. Firstly, it needs to store that output somewhere safe, and that's what artifact stores are for. So we've got JFrog Artifactory, which is very popular. Again, that comes in two varieties. You've got the software as a service that JFrog will happily charge you for, um, and they also do a licensed version where you can install it on your own setup. There's also other tools like Nexus, which can store certain types of uh, artifact. And then if you really are just dealing with Docker images, then hey, why not have your own Docker registry? And so the final category is cloud platforms, um, which is kind of an oxymoron in a way, but you can have a private cloud. Whoa. But if you're looking at public cloud, AWS, Azure, Google, um, Hetna, I think, are doing some stuff in that space as well. You've got uh, DigitalOcean. They're all kind of starting to do some cloudy stuff. But what do I mean by that? I mean anything that you can go to an API. And when I'm talking about APIs, I expect Terraform to be able to talk to it. And you can say, hey, give me a server. And it goes, Here you are. Now I'll start billing you for it. And then we get our configuration management comes along makes that server useful, and then we're getting some value. And then uh, we can close it off again. But we can also do this from a private point of view. Now, if you want to save money by having your own hardware that's a little bit more robust than, say, Amazon's, because, you know, if you're running Amazon hardware, it's cheap, they charge you for it, and it can fail. 
Uh, if you want to take more control and have a data center, that's great as well. In which case you can have your own uh, APIs running like OpenStack or VMware. And that's more under your control as far as the physical hardware is concerned. And that might be something that you're looking for. So how do you evaluate these? Well, we've got open source, we've got the self-hosted, but the biggest thing to mind out for is knowledge bias. What I mean by that is if you've used a tool before, you might automatically gravitate to that tool, which is okay because of the learning curve, but it might not be the best tool for the job. So be sure to evaluate other options, not just the one you've heard of before. If you're on your own, this can be tricky, but if you've got a community like I have, we can bounce uh, ideas off of each other and uh, more about that later. Uh, integration and automation. So some of these tools work really well together. The so Grafana works well with um, the Elk stack. It also integrates quite nicely with a whole load of other stuff and comes with databases if you're going for the SaaS option. Um, do they work well with GitOps? Yeah. What is GitOps, I hear you ask? If you want to know, ask me in the questions and I'll spin out another video just for you for that. And uh, can we put it in pipelines? Does it have a command line interface or do we have to go through an API and that kind of thing? So we want these things to be able to talk to each other. We want to be able to automate them through command line type programming and we want them to be user friendly. And then on the back end of that maintenance. So I've touched on maintenance already. If it's self hosted, you know, you're it. If um, JFrog announce a new patch version for Artifactory and you're self hosting that, you've got to be able to uh, install and upgrade that thing on your own. Okay? They might give you a bit of um, support with that. Uh, but it, it's you, you're, you're uh, self-hosting it, you're looking after that. Whereas the software as a service versions, you know, it's up to the provider in order to look after that. And so it costs a little bit extra, but then that's quite a lot of um, responsibility that they're taking off of you and it makes your life a little bit easier. And so we can review what's going on, make sure they're updated and patched with all the latest security releases. And of course, don't forget, there's new tools coming out all of the time. You know? So then there's the new and shiny. You know, not all software is really, really old. You know, JFrog's been around for a while, but it's got newer versions. And those newer versions have newer features. But then there's some tools that uh, never existed 20 years ago. You know, Kubernetes um, didn't exist. It's a new tool at one point. So don't forget that the newer tools are coming out and uh, keep your eye on the channel and I'll let you know about those new tools as soon as I hear of them. So if you're ready to like and subscribe to the content, then be my guest. I really love new subscribers. And if you like the video, I'm more like to do other uh, stuff like this. If there's something that I've skipped over or something that you want to know, then please uh, hit me up in the comments and I'll uh, get back to you and maybe create a video. So um, that's uh, the summary coming up where we've spoken about lots of tools in the DevOps space and um, some of them can be self-hosted, some of our software as a service and some of them are a blend of the two. Don't always go with the one you've heard of straight away. There might be another tool that's even better than the one you're currently using. And next week, there might be a new tool that none of us are even aware of right now, which might be the best thing since sliced bread but we'll have to wait for next week to see what that is. There's also lots of other tools that I've not mentioned here, like online office and collaboration, managed infrastructure, databases, containers, that kind of thing. And it's up to you to uh, migrate to a new tool and adopt that if that's what you want to do, um, or just stick with what you know. Uh, like I said, there's, there's bonuses and drawbacks with both of those things. Um, and I say, if you've got any questions, please reach out, stick it in the comments below. Um, you might find me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I'm also doing a DevOps answers really soon. Um, there's a link to the wait list in there where you can ask me live uh, questions and I'll give you a live answer. So that's exciting stuff to look forward to. And until next time, may all your deployments be smooth.